as I was studying for this message, I was thankful to God for this amazing word that we have in our hands. And I got to thinking of how many hours I've spent with the Lord in his word and how he's changed my life. And I got to thinking that over the 17 years since I've given my life to Christ, I've spent approximately 10,000 hours in his word, not to mention how many commentaries I've read and videos I've watched and sermons I've listened to and sermons I've read. I just thought, wow, Lord, how amazing, how amazing are you? Are you amazed by the Lord today? Yes. So many times we can get pretty comfortable in our Christianity. I don't want to be comfortable anymore, Lord. As I was reading, as I often do, I try to find everything in context because it's so important as the Lord's talking with us and I was in uh, Luke chapter 19, so we'll be in the book of Luke. And I got to verse 41 of the 19th chapter of Luke. Being that it's Palm Sunday, I thought it was appropriate to bring a message out of this particular book. And when I came across this verse, I thought, wow. One verse says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He wept over it. He had already known that the prophecies had been given. And of all people, the Jewish people should have known this day of visitation. He says, if thou hast known, even you, at least in this your day, they should have known that it was him. All the people gathered and were saying, Hosanna in the highest. Hail Jesus. Next week, we'll talk about when they turned the story and said, nail Jesus instead of hell, the king. So as I got here, I I started to read before, just maybe this whole chapter. And as I read this chapter, I read the chapter before it, just because The lessons that are being taught are so powerful and are so amazing and so for me and so for you. And I found myself reading the book backwards. I went to chapter 15 where this dialogue had begun and then read forward again. And I was just amazed that the Lord would speak to us in his word. All of it was applicable to me. Everything. It was amazing. And I'm I'm reminded of his weeping over the city, over Jerusalem. I got to thinking, are there times, Lord, where I bring shame to your name? Are there times where I don't I don't think of you as highly as I ought to. And I think of myself, my needs and what I want. As I had gotten to the 17th chapter, I was reminded because it's in my notes at the very front. And I hear him say, Be not many masters, knowing that they shall receive the greater condemnation. It's very humbling to teach God's word. And we're not to do it flippantly. 
It's precious and it brings life. So here in the 17th chapter, I got to thinking about the disciplines that we need provided to us by the Lord himself because left to ourselves, we're not very disciplined, are we? Honestly. We need him for everything. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. I can do nothing apart from him and neither can you. So let me read this, it's 10 verses. And I don't really wanna spend an overwhelming amount of time here, personally. It says, Luke 17, one. Then he said unto the disciples, it is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turns again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the roots and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the temperance to bring this word would bring you glory and honor and high praise. Amen. And it's in your mighty name, the powerful name, the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I had to tell you all that because that's the process that I was in to get to our passage of scripture today. And so I come from this heart where Jesus wept. And I'm so thankful that he's risen. Amen. Amen. That we serve a living God. Hallelujah. In this message, I had spent some time looking at some commentaries. Warren Wearsby has some amazing commentary. Um, and I actually printed it and read through it because it was so good. <laughs> I don't know how much of that I'll reference, but I pray that, uh, that we would spend time in the word, spend time in prayer that we would look to, to those who have spoken on the word, who have spent a great amount of time studying and living out a life, and that we can glean from their experience and their walk with our Savior. Yeah. I wrote down a few things that I just wanna read, and then we'll see how this unfolds. Oftentimes when you're studying the word of God, especially in context, you want to understand the meaning. What was the Lord meaning here? And he starts off after telling us about hell. In the presence, if you look at uh, Luke 15, you'll see that there were 
Publicans and sinners and Pharisees and his disciples were with him as well. He shares this uh, amazing insight into heaven and hell. Most of what the Lord had said often offended people, did it not? And then for others, they were comforted. That's an amazing thing. How the same word can do so much and actually do things in reverse, it seems. He says it's impossible that offenses will come. In this, he truly means don't be a stumbling block. It's wonderful to come to church. It's wonderful to go out into the world. It's wonderful to have a day, to go home to family or friends. But of all the things that I read from 15 to 19, and as many things that applied to me, this applies to me as well, but applies to us as a church. And it had to have been something that the apostles thought, wow, the Lord just said something that was so profound and they took it so seriously that as their lives are recorded in the book of Acts, we see them operating in the full power of his spirit. He says, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. The most amazing thing about this word offense is we think of maybe saying something that's offensive. But this word here is scandalon, where we get the word scandal from. And there are things that are happening in the church today at large, in mass, not just in the U.S., but in other countries that are scandalous to the name of Christ, the things that are being said. I'm so thankful in the book of Acts, I see them giving examples of, of how to live a life in Christ. I'm thankful that the Lord was very specific to state things, but this offense is more like a trap. It's like a... a a line that's there and, and it goes to a trap and then there's this, this sapling that's put on the end that's the, the spring of it, the trigger. And that's this offense. So when the disciples heard this, as they're called here, the apostles heard this, he was, he was telling them as he's entering into this passion, don't be caught up in a scandal. Don't be the one that causes offense to these little ones. How many people have been saved less than five years? Raise your hand. I've seen great growth. Everyone in this context here is a new believer. Truly, they're a new believer. I mean, even the apostles, although they've walked with him and seen him do amazing things and ministered directly by him, they still were under five years with him. He says, it's impossible that they will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. The meaning is don't be a stumbling block, brothers and sisters. Don't be a stumbling block to your brother and sister next to you. Don't be a stumbling block to somebody else by the lifestyle that you live. The things that you say, the way that you say them, it's not okay for us to act out in the flesh and not repent. It's not. He says here, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. The greatest offense that I see right now are preachers standing behind the pulpit preaching something that God did not say. It does not say it in his word and they are making a ministry and a kingdom unto themselves and they are duping the church of Christ. They are ravenous wolves that have entered into the churches. And I assure you, their doctrines are not too far from this place. 
the word of faith, the new apostolic reformation, signs and wonders that are being that are taking place in these ministries. Maybe in the next few weeks, I'll actually talk about what God says about prophets and false prophets. If there's only two people, Lester and Sam, that I can minister to, to protect you from these wolves and this heresy and the damnation of their doctrines so that you can live a life that's full in Christ, then I will. You guys can come sit down right here and I'll pull up a chair and we'll just talk and let everybody else listen. I pray that you guys are wiser than some of these other folks that I see with 10,000 people sitting in their churches saying amen to heresy, absolute heresy. They don't know who Jesus is. They think that he's some guy that's up in a cloud somewhere and they have to give him permission to do stuff here on earth. Who do we serve? I do not serve that God who needs my permission to do a dagnabbed thing. He is God. He was here before I ever got here. I and merely a servant. Yes. Yes. And the most amazing and blessed thing is that as a servant, I just do what I'm supposed to do yes. and that's what you're supposed to do. Yes. Amen? Yes. Isn't it thanks enough that we're saved? Yes. I don't need a pat on the back from the Lord. I am privileged to be in service to Him. Yes. All of us together. But the balance of privilege is responsibility. And there are certain things that we should be responsible for and the things that we say, the things that we teach, the life that we live out in Christ should come with great responsibility. We should at least take it that way. So, Someone may trespass in these things. As cross life grows, I'm going to guarantee you heresy is going to walk through that door. Guaranteed. And that heresy is going to come with a smile. And it's not going to come with this voice. Hey, buddy. It's going to come with a nice, friendly voice. That voice is going to speak some Christianese to you. It's going to talk about being born again. It's going to come to a place where the trap is set and offense will come. I hate this part because I don't like confrontation. But as a pastor, I have a duty. As a believer, I have a duty. We're all in the same boat. Is this just for pastors or is this for all of us? First of all, he says that this offense <clears throat> this offense should be addressed. As a pastor, my my goal is to raise up people in Christ. And I'm going to say this. This is sufficient for me. This is sufficient for me. I don't need anything else but his word. His word is truth. Amen. It speaks of Jesus who is truth. And the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself, but speaks of truth leads us into all truth and leads us to Christ who is truth. I'm good. The all sufficiency of scripture is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Do you feel blessed that you have God's word? If someone were to come in with heretical doctrines, to infiltrate the church, 
to make it weak, thinking that it's stronger. One thing that I've noticed about the heresies that are in the churches today is it feeds the flesh and it makes you look like you got something going on. I hear it all the time. I hear people claiming authority that was not given to them and spilling it out as if it was something amazing, declarative with nothing happening afterwards, non-causative. Kind of sounds like this. I take authority in the name of Jesus. I I declare and I decree that this is finished. That this demon, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. I take you as strong man and I tear off your armor. You will be banished. I demand it in the name of Jesus. I, me, my, me, 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 me. Lord Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And he said, pray this way, our heavenly father. Watch out for the me monster. It's indicative of those who think they have something that they don't have. Verse three says, Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. I've heard some great prayers. And I am am very thankful that, that people desire to know him more closely. And they want to operate in this place of his anointing and his blessings. I just know that we can't cross the line and think that we're doing something that we are not doing, that Christ is doing through us. It's easy to cross. And I've seen people who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of their heart. Their salvation is never in question, but the doctrines that they have adopted into their common practice comes from the word of faith. It comes from a little God doctrine. And it's dangerous. I am not God. I'm not Mormon, so I won't become a God. I'm a child of the most high God. Hallelujah. I have been adopted and uh, engrafted into the vine. And I can do nothing apart from the vine. It is all him. He gets the glory. I don't want anything. I am so thankful to be a servant, to be used of him, to proclaim his word. He has declared, and I have the opportunity to say what he said. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And don't get me wrong. I do get it wrong. I'm not perfect. I say the wrong thing every single week. You know it. I don't have to tell you. (laughs) I stand up here oftentimes with my foot in my mouth. But all I want to do is bring him glory. And all I want to see you is powerfully used of God. That's it. I have no other agenda except to see you blessed and whole in Christ. That is my desire. I don't come up here for the money. I come up here because I love Jesus. And if you guys didn't show up one Sunday, I would just go do it somewhere else. Because I cannot not preach Jesus. I know that was a double negative. Told you. Told you. Told you. So he says, take heed to yourself. I pray that if you have ears to hear, that you hear. Jesus said that often. If you have ears to hear, listen, hear this. Take heed unto yourself. There's no reason for us to be judged by others if we judge ourselves. 
Take heed to these things. Please don't be naive. There are so many sheep, uh, sheep, sheep and wolf's clothing, uh, wolves and sheep's clothing out there. I'm telling you, you've got to be on guard. Satan wants you powerless. Or Satan wants you empowered with yourself. As long as it doesn't necessarily bring glory to the Lord. There are things that happen sometimes with me and people are like, bless you or you're amazing or something stupid. I am nothing, brother and sister. I'm nothing. But I am something and someone in Christ. And so are you. If we think of ourselves more highly than we ought and we do it often, we just do. We think we're somebody. And apart from Christ, we're nobody. In Christ, it's an amazing, it's amazing how he uses us. Now, most people would think that this is just offenses. So I say things that offend people all the time. I'm attempting with every fiber of my being to teach truth because I'm accountable to God for what I teach. I am personally accountable to God for what I teach. And when I understand this passage of scripture saying that it would be better if Eric Philpot had a millstone tied around his neck and him thrown and cast into the sea than to offend one of these little ones, his people. Shame on me if that happens. I, I, I don't want that. We should take the things that we proclaim very seriously because the Lord does as well. But here's the amazing thing. People have done all kinds of stuff, all kinds of offenses. I have heard some of the most, I've heard some of the strangest doctrines from sincere believers. And I didn't really question whether they were believers, but I questioned the theology that they have adopted because they had to have learned this from somebody else because it's not in the scriptures. So what do you do? Well, immediately you pull out a small stick, smack them in the side of the neck and call them a heretic and shoo them away. No, no. The Lord only did something like that once that we can identify. And it was when his church had been turned into a place of merchandise instead of prayer. Wow, that's offensive. So offensive that the Lord started turning over tables and smacking people with a whip to get them out of there. Sounds like he's pretty passionate about a few things. And this is a very bold statement that he says, but here's what he says. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Now, one of the, the hardest things for us to do is to forgive folks for whatever reason. We just have a difficult time doing it. We can harbor animosity and the root of bitterness. We can let it grow deep, 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 deep while we prune the top of this tree to make sure that it doesn't expose itself too much. And that's another big thing to God is forgiveness. How big a deal was that? Well, he afforded forgiveness through Christ and the sacrifice that we're going to celebrate in the death of our Savior and his resurrection over death. That's a beautiful thing, amen? amen. So all of that was done for what? So forgiveness can be afforded. So forgiveness is kind of a big deal. So he says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. That's the part I don't necessarily like, the rebuking part. Because in rebuke, it doesn't have to be done harshly. It can be done softly. But oftentimes it is justified at that point in time, which makes it a little more difficult. And we don't know how to, when I say justified, it's like, hey, brother, I don't necessarily think that the Lord was, was mentioning anything about a serpent seed and that Satan had, had sexual relations with, with Eve. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? 
and you're beginning to start this point of rebuke in the softest, kindest, Galatians 1, restoration, and they begin to go off and justify the doctrines that they've learned from someone else. There's no doubt that it was someone or something, but it was not the Holy Spirit that revealed this to them. Because we don't know the outcome when we go to correct someone, we tend not to do it. Because one, that's easier, but that is also disobedient to Christ. As this church grows, some of you might say, well, if it ever does, if it ever does, it's gonna need this, that, and the other, and it's gonna need this, and it's gonna need this ministry and that ministry, and if it's gonna happen, this, this, if, 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 if. It's gonna happen when we get our rights, our hearts right with God. That's when it's gonna happen. God has seen that there is a mess outside there and he doesn't need another one. We don't need to be a part of some mega movement of a bunch of hypocrites and goofballs out there preaching some Jesus that doesn't exist. So I'm thankful for that. But as we come across other believers who haven't had a church home for a long time, guess who their church is? Their church is YouTube. Their church is their Facebook posts and things like this. And there's all kinds of goofiness there that, that people adopt. They adopt it and they learn it and they believe it. And so it does make it difficult to correct these things. But we are called to do that because we operate with a heart of forgiveness. Now, one thing I'll share with you as your pastor that offends me more than anything else is to watch heresies being promoted within this body and in this fellowship. I don't like it. I'm sorry that I have to tell you that. But to unpack some of these things is difficult. And I first and foremost pray that the Holy Spirit reveal these things before I inject myself, because as soon as I inject myself, there's going to be a problem. But if the Holy Spirit can do it before I have to, hallelujah. Amen. When I do correct, it's so that we can have unity and be restored. Because it's so difficult for me to fellowship with heretics. I have difficulties with heretical doctrines when I see doctrines of demons. And I'm glad. I hope you adopt that too. I hope that you can see truth. Because what he says is rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Don't harbor animosity. Don't harbor any bitterness towards them. We make mistakes. We adopt things that, that, uh, that seem plausible at the time. And I've just talked with so many people and you show them in scripture something, they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's totally different. They see it for themselves. His word is powerful to changing these things. The problem is most people will, will come to a congregation and they'll listen to folks like me. They'll listen to what I have to say, but they won't open their Bibles. They won't read it for themselves. They don't look at the original first so that they can determine that if this preacher is preaching heresy, they can identify it because they know the word. That's what I see with folks like Kenneth Copeland, for instance. Here are a couple of names I may just actually put something together so that we can actually see some of the things that have been said, brothers and sisters, that will blow you away, that people are sitting there amen in this junk. Dangerous, damnable doctrines that I'm certain are displeasing to the Lord. I was hoping that this message wasn't gonna be so sobering in the beginning I didn't know how it couldn't be, and, and it is. <laughs> but here's what we have. We should operate with a heart of forgiveness. 
I can forgive a brother who's trespassed against me. And the things that I think are trespasses in this, in this context is leading to some bitterness because you believe something that is against the word of God. And I'm trying to maintain a fellowship with you, but I'm not going to rebuke you over that. But yet I know that you're going to share this with her and then you're going to share it with him. And then you're going to talk about these things and do these things. And next thing you know, it's, it's like a cancer begins to grow. I pray because the Holy Spirit resides in you. That when the Lord takes me off of this planet and I pray, Lord, come quickly. I want to be with Jesus. That you will be operating with truth, that you can identify truth yourself, that you're not going to be hooked into some practice or tradition of men, at least so easily. Why do I say all this? Because in the last days, there are going to be doctrines and signs and wonders that are so great, that are so grand, that are so convincing that it even might dupe the elect themselves. It is that convincing. And if we're not at that place just yet, maybe we should be practicing discernment a little bit more. Preparing ourselves for this great ruse that's coming in the last days. But when we rebuke them, it can be with the same voice that I'm talking now. It doesn't have to be loud like I was about five minutes ago. It's a good approach initially. I like to assume that they're going to see the truth. And when they see the truth, then they will repent. And when they repent, I'm already prepared to forgive them. And let's move forward. In uh, when a relationship is dam damaged by the things that you say, there's a process to reconciliation. And a relationship can be damaged because of the heresies that people adopt in their life. Some of them aren't saved at all. But I just know that approaching the situation and talking about these things is, is the important first step. The Bible gives us in Matthew chapter 18, the process of some disciplines that take place in the church. First and foremost, go to them one-on-one, -on -one. amen? And if they will not hear you, then you take two or three others so that every word might be established. And if they still won't repent, then you bring it before the church. Now that would tear up some churches to bring it before the church so with a lot of churches and with some discernment, you would bring it to a council of elders within that church to discuss these things. Unrepentant people are dangerous, folks. Did you know that? Especially in the church. Because they'll double down in their unrepentant-ness, if you will. And they'll often try to divide or destroy the church. This is why I don't like it. I pray that we would just have discernment ourselves, amen? And that we would rebuke them when necessary. And if they repent, forgive them. Now we know that forgiveness is something that we need to do for ourselves. We've talked about this before. Even if they don't repent, we still need to forgive them, amen? I know it's tough. I know it's hard. But the Lord speaks about this as well. That is a release for you so that you're not bound with the, the, the burden of bitterness. And although they don't ask the question, it's very apparent that, they, that the Lord perceives that they're going to ask this question. How many times? Because at some point I've told you that this is wrong and then you didn't repent and you continued in this. And I came to you again, I said, hey, I thought we talked about this a couple of weeks ago and yet they're continuing to do this. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. And they repent. 
And then a week later, they do it again. And I went to them and said, hey, uh, we've already talked about this a couple of times now. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not even paying attention. I, I, I've got some bad habits or whatever it is. Please forgive me. Okay, I'll forgive you. The question is, how many times though, right? Like how many times? Because <laughs> it's already been three and this is, you know, <laughs> getting to be an issue. The Lord says, and if he trespassed against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. You will forgive him. You must forgive him. You shall forgive him. Not you may. You shall. So the next logical question would come, how are we going to do this? <laughs> because this isn't going to go down. <laughs> I don't see how this is going to happen. Seven times in a day? Are you kidding me? And then he goes into this passage in verse six. So they don't say, how is this possible? They're hearing what he's saying. They're, they're, they're trying to comprehend and understand exactly what he's saying. And their response is, increase our faith. Increase our faith. We, we trust you and what you're saying, but, but this has happened in the past. And, and, and I'm just, increase our faith. Increase our dependency on what you're saying right now. How is this done? This is a passage that's often taken out of context. If you had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it shall obey you. So this means that if I pray with faith that I can go outside and I can see a tree from here and if I have the right faith and trust in God, I can speak to this tree and this tree is going to rise up out of the earth and its roots are going to dangle there. And I can say, be thou gone in the name of Jesus. And it's going to fling through the air and land in the sea. Is that what it means? Because if that's what it means, we're all going to walk outside and watch you do it. Who's heading out? I'm not. Does that almost sound ridiculous to think like that? I know this is, this is the part that, that's tough when it's teaching. Because you might have heard that if I have the right faith, if I have enough faith, then I can speak to a mountain and that mountain will be cast into the sea along with the tree. Is that what Jesus is talking about? That he's given us the authority to move the earth? I think that's something that he does, isn't it? So what is he saying? If it's not that, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my faith just isn't strong enough. Maybe I didn't charge up this morning. I, I'm not sure where the power connector is for the right amount of faith in my battery. And I can't dispense of the power that God has given me to get that tree to move. I just have little faith. So the Lord says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can speak to this sycamine tree, which has deep roots. What is the context that he's talking here? Did he just change the game all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, just jumps up? And from, from this place of, hey, if you offend somebody, I'd rather you be cast into the sea yourself. Oh, there's a mention of it. Um, but you need to forgive, but you have to go through a process of rebuking them. They repent. Oh, but hold on a second. I'm just going to jump over here real quick. If you have the faith that, that this active faith, with, we need active faith, don't get me wrong, that we can speak to stuff and it moves. I don't believe that. And if I'm wrong, I will grow 
and I will know because it's my desire for truth. But I do not recall anyone in my circle of friends or associates, and I'm dealing with a lot of pastors here in various states and in other countries that have not been able to move trees and bushes out of the earth. I think to even say that we could do that almost might feed our flesh and that's dangerous. So he's talking in the context of forgiving, how can we do this, increase our faith? It takes the faith of a mustard seed. Do you trust me? If you trust me, whatever this is, no matter how big this issue is, no matter how deep the roots are, no matter what fruit is growing on it, you can remove this from your life. Faith. Forgiveness, fruitfulness. Some people won't agree with me. We could talk about it later. But I sure do want to get to sound doctrine instead of this form of mysticism that's entered into the church. And that's really what it is. It's almost a new age mysticism that's entered into the church. And we take all things away from the Lord by claiming authority. He has been given, he has been given all authority in heaven and earth. And never did he say, I give you all authority in heaven and earth. I give it to you. I'm thankful that he's in us. But there's certain things that are reserved for God. There's certain things that are reserved for God. I can't just claim it from him. I think that that's along these lines of offense. He continues though. He says, but let me balance this, but, but which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go sit down to meet and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherein I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I don't think so. So likewise you, when you shall done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty. When we take this one particular passage of scripture, verse six out, and we think that we are somebody other than unprofitable servants, we are doing a great disservice to the body of Christ. There are certain things that God has given us authority to do, and for whatever reason, they don't always happen. Casting out demons. Certainly, he says that that's something that will be a sign not a sign every time, but a sign that follows. It happens. And healing. And raising the dead. That's going to be another one that's pretty uh, rare, might I add. Rare that happens. Doesn't happen every day. Doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't mean that if you haven't raised somebody from the dead, you're not a believer. Because these are the signs that follow. For us to be considered believers, we need to raise somebody from the dead. I am saved by grace, through faith, in Christ, alone, alone, alone. And I'm thankful to be in service to him as a preacher of his word. I'm thankful that I'm in service to him. An unprofitable servant. Don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, but certainly don't think of yourself less than you should. An unprofitable servant is blessed. This is a man of many trades, and the Lord has employed us into many different things. This was a person who was plowing fields and raising cattle, and he could cook. 
and he was in service to his master and he was thankful to be doing these things. And he didn't ask for thank yous and attaboys. He did what was asked. He was blessed. He was blessed. He was blessed. So that's point number one. I wrote all this out just to kind of show that I take some time in thinking with the Lord about these things before I just blurt something out. Because I know that I'm held to a higher standard in many regards. But I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, honestly, you are held to a higher standard as well. In your lifestyle. I don't know if cross life is ever going to grow. I'm thankful to be in service to him. Honestly, I want to see people saved. I want to see people whole. I do this with joy, but at times it's a burden. And I don't think it should be. What makes it the biggest burden is that there's no discipline in his body. If this in fact is Christ's church and he has placed the mantle of pastor on me, I don't want anything, any harm to come to you. But if you're going to go out and say things and do things that reflect on this church, would you expect that I would come to you and say, hey, what was that? I would like for you to be forthcoming. I'm thankful for those that are. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this or that. Brother Lamb and I talk often about different things that, and I love those conversations. And even in the smaller things, a little ad that was put together that's gonna be posted on Facebook and on Band, that it gets sent to myself and Suzette and And look at it. And it's beautiful. It's fantastic. And sent to others as well so that we can make sure that it's it's excellent and that it looks and represents Christ well. Those are small things. I think in all this, as I found this, the Lord sometimes, although he is joy, he looks down and sees what's going on in church today. And I would have to say, if he could be displeased, which we can see in scripture that he, he has certainly been in the past, that he's displeased with the way that we serve. We don't do what's been commanded of us and we're constantly adding things that we think he wants us to do or should do and it's really kind of a looking for an attaboy, feeding the flesh. I pray that cross life grows. Or I pray that cross life closes. But to say stagnant, stagnant, yeah. To say in a place where we're just kind of a click of folks, even if cross life didn't exist and you went to other churches, guess what? There's friendships that were made, amen? And if that were to happen, which I'm not saying that it is, and this me speaking things into existence crap, get over it. I can't make this church do anything by the words I say, except that I can bring life or death to your mind by the things that I say. I'm not interested in cross life closing, but if it did, know this, I am saved and you are saved and you're going to know me for all eternity because I'm going to be in heaven with you. Amen. You just can't get rid of me like that. (laughs) That is my point. I want for this to be a beautiful thing for others. Hallelujah. But I also want us to examine ourselves. Don't just speak things that you just recently heard on a YouTube video. Get in God's word and make sure the teachers that you do listen to aside from me are grounded in scripture. 
I have seen too many. There's far too many out there, brothers and sisters. This is a plead of my heart. When I saw that Jesus wept over this over the city, I see me weeping over cross life because it's a a fragile, fledgling part of the body. This is not the strongest church in America right now. It can be. But if we don't begin to get serious, I guess, with God's word, then I'm asking the Lord to give me freedom to go do something else. I don't know that he will. I don't know that he will. But I don't like playing games. I don't like having to read stuff and hear stuff and all kinds of things and and just see just little goofiness going on in our little congregation. It's just like, come on, Lord. How much longer must I suffer to be with them? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) I am teasing about that. The Lord said that, though, by the way, just so you know. He said that, too. I don't have a close, so I'm going to do a crash landing. This was just something as we're approaching next week. As we take the Lord's Supper next Sunday together as a congregation. I don't want us to enter it into all goofy. Lying to God and lying to one another. Latching on to trash and garbage that fills this sanctuary. That's a stench to his nostrils. And we can do it worthily. The only one that makes us worthy is Christ. But worthily. So that we enter in. And we partake in something intimate with him. It's not just something that we flippantly do. You'll notice that I don't do the Lord's Supper very often. Some people would say, well, we do it every week, and some churches do. I've been to those churches that actually do it every week. And I saw it come to a place in that church where they would just have it set up at the back table. It's just something to do. People would walk by, and they're like, flip it. Whereas we see in Corinthians where they say, some of you are taking it unworthily. Some of you are sick because of it. Some of you are dead because of it. I just, I just believe in this. I believe that God has given us this. And I believe that he speaks to us through this This beautiful, amazing book. And when he says something and it's a command, then we do it because we're unprofitable servants. Now, here's the difference and I'm done. In this particular parable that the Lord is is going over, he ends with unprofitable servants. And he, he sta- states it in such a way that, that we shouldn't be looking for accolades or rewards. We've already been blessed with our salvation, have we not? We've already been blessed with this new creation. We've already been blessed with the sealing of the Holy Spirit who indwells us and from time to time overflows through us. Hallelujah. Just being honest. Well, Our king, our master, has set up treasures for us in heaven. And there will be a great reward to us. And honestly, brothers, sisters, we don't deserve it. But we get it. That's how loving he is. How merciful he is. How full of grace he is. How patient he is. How understanding he is. How rewarding he is. He is. And then he supplies rewards in heaven.
Now, my greatest reward is the joy that I have in serving the Lord. And I'm not upset with anybody, by the way, just so you know, I'm just that kind of guy. I just want us to be real. I think there's some dangerous stuff out there. And I have seen people bordering on some dangerous things that they say and do because they tend to elevate themselves a little bit higher. Jesus is preeminent. Make him known. I want no glory. He deserves all the glory. I pray that that would be in our hearts. I recall the time in, there's, there's several times, but there's one in particular that uh, the Lord used me And I saw him do some amazing things in the healing of a woman who was crippled. This is only my personal story. This isn't to validate anything about I'm holier than anybody else. I'm just saying I've seen the Lord do things. And when this happened, although I was praying, although I was laying hands on this person and I was speaking English and they didn't speak English, but it was being interpreted to them in their native language. And when she stood up, having been crippled all of her life, I literally can remember being in that room and I stood back and it just felt like I wasn't there. Like, Lord, Lord, <laughs> Lord, and just give him glory and give him praise for what he's done. I wasn't anybody special. I wasn't any super Christian. I wasn't, you know, holier than, than anything. I was just available and willing and I was a servant. And when I had that spirit of being an unprofitable servant, I see the Lord use me the most. And when I see my desires and my ambitions and me and my and the me monster gets on me, I see very little effective ministry. I've been trying to speak truth. I pray that it's received. As we prepare for next week, I don't know that the message will be this long. I honestly don't want it to be, <laughs> but I want it to be real. I want us to come real servants of the Lord, ready to partake in something beautiful that we've been given. Father, We can only approach you because of the work of Christ. We can only approach you because we are clothed in his righteousness and not our own. We can only approach you because our righteousness is as filthy rags and we dare not raise this up in your presence. Lord, being that you are omnipresent, there should never be a time where we raise our own righteousness up. But that it is your righteousness that clothes us. Lord, I know you wept over the city of Jerusalem. And I know that there are times where it would seem that you would weep over us. Lord, we know that none of this catches you by surprise. So it's not a matter of us thinking that we need to do something so that you're complete and you're whole. But Lord, that, that we would just realize that we can do nothing apart from you. Lord, we truly are unprofitable servants. 
because the only profit that can be gained is in you and through you and for you. If I'm guilty of exalting your name above all things, Lord, then I pray that there is enough evidence for my conviction. I boast not in myself, but in the Christ, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, this is my prayer for cross life, that we truly would live our lives clothed in your righteousness and in the cross we boast and in your name we boast, but we boast not in ourselves. Lord, that we would be genuine and true, that we would in fact be purified sanctified and ultimately at some point lord and that day is of your choosing glorified in your presence what a glorious day that will be thank you for this time and your word lord minister to my heart just as much as you're ministering to others and Lord, I pray that this would spark conversations that would lead unto repentance. But Lord, that is your work. We are just your servants. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. if you can. Amen. Amen.